Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, I, I noted that in, uh, in response to Admiral Swift's belly and bladder call, everybody kind of jetted right away after his comments. So, uh, so I don't know, maybe that might have been a sign. Uh, but I wanted to just take a second again to thank Admiral Swift and his esteemed uh, uh, panelists this morning, Jim Holmes, John Culver, Frank Miller, and the Honorable Bing West for an exceptional discussion uh, this morning regarding a very complex issue. <laughs> <clears throat> they, uh, they set the bar high for this afternoon's panels. Um, it is now my great honor to introduce to you your first afternoon keynote speaker. Uh, Senator Reed was born and raised in Cranston, Rhode Island. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in 1971 and was commissioned in the United States Army. Go Navy. <laughs> I, I knew somebody was going to say it, so I wanted to go right into it. He served in the 82nd Airborne Division as an infantry platoon leader, <clears throat> a company commander, and a battalion staff officer. He eventually joined the faculty at West Point, teaching cadets about the economics and international relations as an associate professor within the Department of Social Sciences. He served as a professor at the U.S. Military Academy until August of 1979, when he resigned from active duty as a captain. He continued serving in the U.S. Reserves until June of 1991, when he left the Reserves with the rank of Major. Senator Reed later earned a master's degree in public policy from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and a law degree from Harvard Law School in 1982. As an attorney, he specialized in banking and securities law. Senator Reed served on the Rhode Island uh, State Senate from 1985 to 1990. He was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1990, where he focused on education and health care for the next six years. In 1996, he was elected to the U.S. Senate and is currently serving as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Senator Jack Reed. Well, thank you very much for that very, very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here today. It's a real privilege. Uh, I had a great morning. I spent it at the Newport Naval Base, where we welcome two new Coast Guard ships, the Tahoma and the Campbell. Uh, so we are typically, we are a multi-service, uh, multi-dimensional facility here at Newport, and I'm very proud of Newport and all you contribute. I also must uh, recognize I have a, a uh, former colleague from the House uh, of Representatives, Ron Makeley. At one time, uh, we're, we were the only delegation in the country, I think this is historic, that both representatives were graduates of military academies. I got a college degree at West Point and Ron graduated from Navy, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> These discussions are incredibly important, bringing together uh, people with great insight like yourselves, great experience. I know. Admiral Harris, Ambassador Harris, has done so much in service to his country, but he's not alone in this room. And getting your thoughts and your ideas is critical. And the War College, once again, is a forum for that kind of contribution to national security. Uh, we face significant challenges. Um, we've already seen, the, with disturbing clarity, Russia's uh, willingness to inflict violence and undermine the global order for its own benefit or for the benefit of Vladimir Putin. States like Iran and North Korea continue to push the boundaries of military brinksmanship, and threats like terrorism, climate change, and global pandemics remain persistent. But among all these challenges, uh, China is clearly emerging as the primary potential threat to our national security. It is the only country in the world with the economic and technological capabilities to mount a sustained challenge to our interests. For the past several decades, China has studied the United States' way of war and focused its efforts on offsetting our advantages. Ironically, China benefited from the operations in Afghanistan and Iraq as we devoted resources and attention to counterinsurgency, they copied, expropriated, and reverse engineered our peer level assets while conducting their own sophisticated research and development. And we see the fruits of Chinese efforts in its fielding of hypersonics, advanced fighter aircraft, expanding naval surface and subsurface capabilities, 
and growing nuclear capacity. For decades, China employed a strategy of hiding its capabilities and biding its time. We mistook this strategy, I believe, as global integration into the economic order as a way to build a middle class and become an economic power along the lines we hoped like that of Japan. But with President Xi, China has demonstrated its real intent. And it's not simply economic, but also decisively diplomatic and military. Beijing does not accept our global leadership or the international norms that have kept the peace for the better part of a century. China has sought to claim leadership positions in multilateral organizations, including the United Nations and the World Trade Organization, with the goal of shaping their policies and actions in line with Beijing's worldview. In other cases, China has sought to establish competing multilateral organizations to safeguard its interests. This competition of ideas and interests will intensify with the shifting balances of military power and divergent visions of governance between China and the West. In its strategy for the Indo-Pacific region, the Biden administration labeled the coming years as the decisive decade for achieving, in their words, an Indo-Pacific that is free and open, connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. The Department of Defense, and especially our men and women in uniform, will play a critical role, but certainly not an exclusive role because we must leverage all elements of our national power to compete with China in that region and worldwide. While our competition with China is not limited to the military domain, there are several defense areas that I believe we should prioritize. To begin, we must set our priorities both for the near and long terms. In the near term, these priorities would include implementing a whole of government strategy for the Indo-Pacific, and responsibly managing our approach to Taiwan. Over the long term, our efforts should center around strengthening our network of allies and partners in the region, including through frameworks such as the Quad and AUKUS. And finally, to succeed in this competition with China, we must identify and understand the nature of our engagement with China and what is key to managing our competitive relationship to deter armed conflict and prevent unintended escalation. To prevail in this competition, we must start with a strategy, a plan of action. The 2022 National Defense Strategy, or NDS, ranks China as the most consequential strategic competitor in the pacing challenge for the Department of Defense. The NDS also describes three primary concepts to help the department achieve its goals which are integrated deterrence, campaigning, and building enduring advantages. And these, I think, are well-reasoned lines of effort that we must pursue. With respect to China, integrated deterrence goes beyond our military posture and capabilities in the region, as I have said. The strategy requires the collective efforts of the US interagencies and those of our allies and partners focus on the principle of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Achieving this will require all levels of our national power, diplomatic, economic, and informational, backed by the reassurance of our military presence. And regrettably, many of our levers of national policy and power have atrophied. For example, our State Department workforce was hollowed out for several years, weakening our diplomatic influence around the world. Building on this strategy and moving to the campaigning aspect of the NDAs outlines a steady drumbeat of military engagements with allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific, ranging from joint and combined exercises to security assistance programs. And I believe these activities are foundational for reassuring our allies and partners in the region, providing opportunities for new engagement and complicating Chinese strategic decision making. Again, we have to not just think in new terms, we have to practice what we're thinking about. And we put a big emphasis on operational activities 
integrate it with our allies and partners. And the final building enduring advantages line of effort, the department will support our men and women in uniform and their families while investing in cutting edge technologies that will be game changers on the battlefield of the future. The NDS must be considered in light of obviously of budget constraints and competing challenges, particularly when it comes to the Department of Defense between modernization versus readiness and force structure. And getting that balance right is very important for our long-term competition and one of the key tasks that we must perform in the United States Congress. And all of these efforts must be informed by a rigorous study of military history, our own capability, and those of our allies, and an understanding of the philosophies, objectives, strengths, weaknesses, and cultures of our adversaries. And that is why your work here at the Naval War College is so important. It is truly foundational to all the other lines of effort that comprise our national defense strategy. Having traveled multiple times to Afghanistan and Iraq, I was over and over impressed with the power of culture, both to enable, but more importantly, to disable efforts that we were trying to pursue collectively. And it is here at the Naval War College where your students have the opportunity, indeed the responsibility, to look at all of these very sophisticated aspects of international behavior. And again, very proud that the Naval War College is here in Newport. Now, we all recognize that in the near term, the flashpoint that could turn competition with China into conflict is Taiwan. If China is a pacing threat for the Department of Defense, a conflict over Taiwan is the pacing scenario. The world is right to be concerned about this possibility, especially after China's frequent and more and more and more robust military exercises in the Taiwan Strait over many years. And it's brutal repression of pro-democracy demonstrations and the democratic process in Hong Kong. Again, when the British left, we assume that, uh, you know, two, two cultures, one country, two the systems would survive, and it hasn't. Just last week, in the wake of Speaker Pelosi's trip to Taipei, Beijing issued an official white paper withdrawing its pledge to not send troops to Taiwan if it were to take administrative control of the island. Again, that is a, a sort of a, a movement away from uh, a sense of uh, restraint on their side. And there has been a decision recently and a discussion recently about whether the United States should be more explicit about coming to Taiwan's aid militarily if they are attacked by China. This has been a long time debate, frankly, and it goes on. And it's a serious debate. It's the debate between strategic ambiguity and strategic clarity. In my view, we should maintain our policy of strategic ambiguity. It's helped maintain the peace in the Taiwan Strait for decades. The intelligence community has assessed and communicated to us that a policy change would be deeply destabilizing and could actually lead to escalation and the very conflict we are working hard to prevent. However, this strategy should not stop us from reinforcing our commitment to helping Taiwan credibly deter China. To begin, we should help Taiwan acquire the defensive capabilities that are most likely to make the Chinese question their ability to take the island by force. In this regard, we need to fully understand the lessons from the conflict in the Ukraine and how those may be applied to building Taiwan's defenses. We should also increase bilateral and, where possible, multilateral exercises with the Taiwan Defense Forces and our allies and partners to improve overall readiness and interoperability. As evidenced in Ukraine and Afghanistan, one of the key factors is measuring a people's will to fight, and it's an extremely difficult factor to evaluate. But it is also extremely important, even decisive, in a conflict. With that in mind, an important signal of Taiwan's willingness to fight has been the significant commitment of their own resources to defending the island against Chinese aggression. I am encouraged by 
Taiwan's recent steps to increase its defense spending. But more must be done to harden their defenses. And the willingness of the people of Taiwan to battle against the Chinese incursion without let up may be the most important factor in both deterring and, if necessary, defeating Chinese military aggression. And that is something we have to constantly monitor. Our experience in assisting Ukraine, while not fully transferable to Taiwan, offers some other lessons. First, long-term and persistent engagement really matters. Our special operations and conventional forces trained and equipped the Ukrainian forces since 2014. That investment, along with the defense reforms Ukraine implemented, is paying clear dividends on the battlefield. Second, logistics are critical. While the international community has been able to take advantage of Ukraine's long land borders, there is no such opportunity for Taiwan in a crisis. This places a premium on pre-positioned equipment. And third, we have to be reminded of the vital importance of secure, unbreakable communications at all levels and between our allies and partners. When I was in the Army decades ago, the saying was, shoot, move, and communicate. Now, I believe it should be communicate so that you can shoot and move. Now, JADC2, JADC2, or Joint All Domain Command and Control, is the overarching term for multiple efforts throughout the Department of Defense to ensure uninterrupted and encrypted communications throughout the services. The ideal would be to acquire targets at early as possible, and to rapidly deliver target information to the best shooter, whether on air, land, or sea. Air Force pilots, Navy pilots, Marines on the ground with anti-aircraft weapons or other suitable weapons, submarines, etc. That's the ideal. We're moving towards that, but it is going to be a significant effort and one that we're focusing on now in the Armed Services Committee to give DOD the tools to make that reality, make that a reality. Now, and if we master these techniques, we still have the challenge of including our allies and partners in this system so that we can operate truly interoperability, interoperably with our allies and partners. One of the things that's the reality today, and I, you all recognize it, is that in any fight in the Indo-Pacific, we cannot assume, nor can our opponent assume, air superiority, or uncontested logistics. Circumstances that we have not faced as a nation until really World War II. So additionally, we face the problem of long-range precision fires, highly advanced air defenses, cyber attacks, disruption of our space-based assets, and the possibility, frankly, of nuclear escalation and any conflict. So we must plan very carefully for the future, and for the worst case, obviously, and work not for the worst case, but for the best case for us. Now, as we consider this dangerous potential flashpoint, America's support to, to Taiwan should be grounded in the principle that we will be prepared to do everything in our power to keep them in the fight for as long as they want to be. Now, turning to longer-term priorities, there is broad consensus that our greatest comparative advantage over China is our network of partners and allies in the region and globally. Strengthening that network should be at the center of any competition for the Indo-Pacific region. The development of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or QUAD, involving the United States, Japan, India, and Australia presents a valuable framework. Similarly, our defense agreement with Australia and the United Kingdom, known as AUKUS, provides a platform for dramatically improving the capabilities of our allies and increasing our multilateral engagement in the region. To that end, I'm encouraged by the focus on reinvigorating our defense alliances and partnerships. For example, the Philippines have reinstated the Visiting Forces Agreement, and we have concluded a new special measures agreement with South Korea to continue the stationing of our forces on the Korean Peninsula. Now, in order to boost our military advantage, 
Further, the Armed Services Committee created the Pacific Defense Initiative, or PDI, to better align defense resources for improving our posture in the region and expanding military-to-military -military partnerships to address China. PDI will remain a priority for the committee as we seek to provide additional funding for military capabilities, strategic forward basing for our military posture, and enhanced training infrastructure and opportunities. Additionally, this year's National Defense Authorization Act seeks to improve the tools available to Indo-PACOM and other combatant commands in the regional competition. The bill would expand commanders' authorities to engage with international partners on topics like maritime domain awareness, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, environmental resilience, operational energy, and empowerment of young civilian defense leaders. I think it's also important to note, however, that our nation's edge over China through partnerships cannot be based on military might alone. Given the economic, cultural, and geographic ties between China and many of our partners and allies, we simply can't ask them to choose between us and China based on a military calculation alone. Indeed, for most countries in the region, including our treaty allies, China is their top trading partner, not the United States. Our ideals and our actions on issues like climate change and economic development must be part of our approach. Competing effectively means that we need to meet our partners where they are and provide value on the security issues that are of most concern to them. Further, we must use our economic strength and financial levers to compete with China's Belt and Road Initiative, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but also in regions like Africa and South America. America's success in competition with China will also depend on our ability to deploy game-changing technologies. The national security environment of the future will be shaped by technologies like quantum computing, 5G, and artificial intelligence and machine learning. It is critical for the Defense Department to find ways to identify new capabilities and deliver them to warfighters at the speed of innovation and faster, much faster than China. And I'm concerned about the department's ability to do this. A particular focus of the Armed Services Committee is on helping the department transform its acquisition and budgeting processes, and I expect we will see improvements in this area. More broadly, however, I'm concerned about the strength of our national research and innovation enterprise, including the workforce, the health of the manufacturing and industrial base, and the infrastructure we need to support technology we have the world's best innovators in the defense industry and commercial sector, and we have to find our ways to help them work more closely together to produce next generation defense system. But in this regard, I'm very proud that the Senate recently passed and the President just signed the CHIPS Plus Act. This legislation will boost U.S. computer chip manufacturing, reduce America's reliance on foreign made semiconductors, and address critical supply chain vulnerabilities. Growing a strong, resilient domestic semiconductor manufacturing ecosystem is critical to America's national security and economic security. And the CHIP Act will go a long way toward this goal, but we still have work to do on our industrial base, a lot of work. And recognizing, obviously, the critical role that naval forces play in the Indo-Pacific, I'm pleased that this year's National Defense Authorization Act Increased support for the high payoff research at the Office of Naval Research, DOPR, and the Naval Undersea Warfare Center here in Newport. Many of you gathered here today are already sharpening our innovative edge through the development of new capabilities and the modernization of operational concepts for surface and undersurface warfare. These advantages will be paramount to our success in the Indo Pacific region. We are entering a long, intense strategic competition with China that will require all elements of national power if we are to succeed. Our greatest challenge may be ensuring that competition doesn't become conflict. The costs of a military conflict with China are hard to fully imagine. In addition to the extensive loss of life and treasure, such a conflict would likely trigger a collapse of the global economy. With our limited needs of bilateral communication, escalation between two nuclear armed forces 
could be proved to be very difficult to manage. And much has been written about the history of conflict between established and rising powers, but history need not repeat itself. Armed conflict between the United States and China is not inevitable. To avoid such an outcome, however, we must seek to clearly communicate our objectives in the Indo-Pacific and establish crisis communications with Chinese officials, not unlike those we had with the Soviet Union during the Cold War to prevent miscalculations. I'm concerned that in retaliation for Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, Chinese leaders apparently ignored phone calls from their US counterparts. They have also signaled their intent to further restrict communication between our militaries on a host of other issues, including counter drug efforts and climate issues. These decisions are misguided and benefit no one. I hope cooler heads will prevail in the coming months and we'll be able to find common ground on this issue. And given the course, the catastrophic cost of the conflict with China, it is clearly in our national interest to deter Chinese aggression and manage escalation to prevent hostilities. The question now is how best to compete with China over the long term while deterring actions that could lead to war. Our military has a key role to play in both competition and deterrence. Well, finally, uh, when I was growing up, uh, the conclusion was that the Soviet Union would someday reach the pinnacle of economic and military power and overwhelm Western Europe, the United States, and NATO. We really feared, uh, particularly if you were in front of a television set in 1962 listening to President Kennedy talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, that we were in a dire circumstance. But what happened is that we were able to, through, I think in many cases, wise judgments and effective military power, deter such a, a conflict. And I think we can do that. I know we're gonna to work to do that with China. Ultimately, um, my great faith rests uh, not on uh, those who discuss national security, but the men and women in uniform who carry it out. Uh, they are our greatest asset, our greatest resource, and we should and must treasure what they will do. Their innovation, their sophistication, their ability to adapt will make us much more threatening to any nation that seeks us ill. So let me, at that point, thank you for your kind attention and the privilege to speak here, and I'd welcome your questions. All the difficult ones will be answered by my staff. <laughs> I, I am a United States Senator, uh, but thank you very, very much. <laughs> well, another stunning performance. Uh, <laughs> now I know Bing has a question. Oh. I've got one up here. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, we've heard for some time that the Chinese are quite adept at taking our R&D and using it for themselves. I wonder to what extent is that still going on when you talk about our future R&D? Are we better protected now from uh, it being stolen? And um, in sort of a twist through the taking of our R&D, are we somehow better prepared because we know what they're using? <laughs> well, I, in my sense is we are better protected, obviously. Uh, first, we became aware of the problem. And I think you can all recall, this is public uh, knowledge, so I, yeah, I'm not disclosing anything, but we had a, a private contractor here in Newport that was penetrated through their age uh, human resources files. And the Chinese didn't get classified information, but they could weave together enough so that they were able to capture ideas, concepts that we didn't want them to have. We fixed that, you know, both the Navy, every service, Army, Air Force, much tighter than that. One of the things we did uh, also in the National De Defense Act a few years ago is that we understood our industrial base is a, a source of a lot of that information uh, and that uh, we had to take steps. So we provided uh, 
a fund of $150 million a year for the submarine industrial base. And part of their activities are not only improving the, the techniques and the quality of the product from the subcontractor, but making sure that their cyber is secure. And we have to do that uh, nationwide. Uh, it's a problem, though, I, I will confess, that uh, we are spending a lot, but nothing compared to some of the private sector. I had the, uh, the chairwoman uh, and the CEO, the first uh, woman uh, leader of a major institution at Citibank, come in, and they spend close to a billion dollars a year on cybersecurity. Of course, on their balance sheet, that saves them much more than they invest. But we're not doing that, so we have to do more. So no one should sit back and say, we've solved the problem, we've got it. We have to invest more in our cross-departmental efforts. Uh, we're doing better in Homeland Security with uh, CISA, the, the Center for Security. And we also have, I think we've got the White House or a former White House right there. We doing okay? In a word? Good. Oh. Good. Uh, so. <laughs> He's the expert. As I said, the tough questions I refer to very knowledgeable people. You know, that's how you survive this. But no, this is a constant problem, and it's evolving every day. And you know, uh, we saw it. Like for example, in Afghanistan, uh, some vendor there handed out free cards for telephones for our troops. They were R Russian cards that tapped into the telephones of these young soldiers, or not so young soldiers, but they'd be just chatting at home and something would slip out. So we have to be constantly on our guard, but I think we're making real progress. And I think one of the keys to the progress was we finally have in place at the White House a national director for uh, these activities. We've strengthened, as I said, the Department of Homeland Security, and we're trying to get our act together across the government. And we're also looking at major industrial systems like electrical systems, uh, FAA, et cetera. But this is an unending battle, and we can't take anything for granted. Uh, someone explained to me, I was down at Robbins Air Force Base uh, on Wednesday, and um, a very bright female lieutenant colonel said, uh, the next conflict will be won in the cyber spectrum, the electronic spectrum. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator Reid, and for joining us here today. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to ask, I think, one of those tough questions. So I have, hope you have someone in your staff here to <laughs> help answer. Uh, what can the legislative branch do to uh, foster innovation from the private sector in a way the executive branch, administration after administration, doesn't seem to be able to do? And by that, I mean break the walls that the primes create around small private businesses and frustrate the ability for America to get its innovation into the DOD. Um, as I said, I don't think the executive branch has done a very good job. Maybe you and your colleagues could help because that's a severe problem. We have some minor efforts like AFWorks and SoftWorks uh, in, in the DOD trying to break those barriers down, but it just it doesn't seem to be enough. But do you have any solutions? Uh, I think we both, uh the legislation and the executive have not done as much as they should. So I, uh, it's not the fault of one or the other. It's both our fault. Uh, for example, right now we're trying to get the extension of the Small Business Innovative Research Act, SBIR, and we're having opposition from just one of my colleagues in the Senate to get it done routinely. So we're contributing the problem too. I don't want to point the finger just to one place. Uh, what we can do and what we've tried to do is to expand some of the discretionary spending of the Department of Defense. You know, we have, have a program in place that I think it's about a $10 million cap where they can really be flexible and, and invest in companies, et cetera, and help companies. But in terms of large scale, that all comes through us. And uh, frankly, we've been very reluctant, either because of institutional inertia or other reasons, to release more flexibility to Department of Defense. I think also, too, you're talking about a Defense Department that's still operating in the context of Robert McNamara. And that was great for industrial society. This is a post-industrial society. Some of the good things they've done, though, uh, they stood up Army Futures Command down in Austin, Texas. 
And they're really, well, moving out. General Murray has done an excellent job down there. But they're looking at those innovative vendors and talking directly to the combat leaders on the ground. What do you need? Can you do this, et cetera? And they're making real progress. So I think the services themselves have to be innovative. And uh, a lot of it is, is giving the incentives uh, to uh, fail, to be blunt. And those incentives aren't built in the culture of DOD or in many other agencies. Uh, as a result, you know, it's check the box. And one thing we have to do, and this is, we've been trying to do this for years unsuccessfully, we have to streamline the contracting process. Uh, we have to get it to the extent that it's reasonable to be done and it can be done in a fast way and there's really competition and small businesses handle that. You know, you've got a really good pro small business with a great idea, but they look and they say, well, this is a 150-page contract, and I don't even know where to begin. I'll do something else. So we have uh, many things we're doing, and we try to do it incrementally in, in legislation because if, if we threw a whole new system in, then just right off two years of trying to figure out you know, who's in charge, what are we doing, et cetera. But we are very focused on trying to improve that because you're absolutely right. We're, we need the, the innovation that is so uh, critical to America and such a part of the American spirit. And we've got to get to the troops a lot faster. Um, the other area I'll mention, and some of this is, is episodic and anecdotal, not analytical, is uh, SOCOM has their own authority to acquire to a certain degree. And they have some very interesting products which are very effective. And we're looking at that model and seeing if we can deploy that to other services and other functions uh, and so they don't have to go through the, the Washington hierarchy. They can do it from SOCOM headquarters in Tampa or elsewhere. Those are just some ideas. But this is a collective responsibility of every aspect of government. And we, you know, we, haven't, we haven't got it right yet. I'll be well, Yes, sir. Uh, Senator, uh, this, this morning we heard more about strategic clarity, and, and your position seems to be more on strategic ambiguity. Uh, so I, I'd like to hear a little more of the history of why the administration has come to that position. It just seems to me that looking at the Wall Street Journal articles lately, that the confidence in the military has gone down from 70 to 45 percent. Uh, as a former military person uh, flying off aircraft carriers, I'd like to have clear, concise strategy knowing what I'm getting myself into. And uh, the word strategic ambiguity doesn't really lend itself to that. So I'm kind of curious how that came about, because in my mind, uh, that's not a strategy at all. Well, uh, what we've got, as I suggested in my comments, from the intelligence community is that this would be a profound shift in our approach, which the Chinese would likely not ignore, an understatement. Uh, but also, it would set off a political dynamic within Taiwan, because now, for the first time, they can claim they can do things and will be right behind their back. There is an independence movement in Taiwan. We have to ask the question, would that be emboldened to take more and more steps, which would feed right into Chinese, red Chinese propaganda about, oh, look, you know, they're, they're breaking away. Uh, that's one aspect of it. There's another aspect of it which is important, I think, too, in terms of, of strategy, time. We are not as positioned today as we would hope to be positioned in the Pacific. If we were to declare tomorrow, oh, no, we're going to defend Taiwan. It's, you know, we're sending a whole brigade of the 82nd there right now. Our time would shrink before I think the, the Chinese would react. And at this point, I think we need time to develop what, what some of the things I talked about. Uh, integrated partnerships with allies, uh, systems in which we can communicate to small units that are identifying targets and shooting them over there. We need some time. So the two, those are the two principal issues, I think, where this issue of strategic ambiguity is, uh, you know, makes sense. The other sense I have, too, is that, you know, that's a, a descriptor for the policy. What I think the China is looking at and what we're looking at is, well, we don't care what they're talking about. What are they doing? And when they see us, which they are, uh, vigorously you know, patrolling in international waters, when they see us uh, beginning to work 
through the Thailand, uh, Taiwan, excuse me, Taiwan Relations Act to support the Taiwanese with real weapon systems. When they see, frankly, one of the impressions I have from the Ukrainian, uh, which surprised me immensely, when they see the world community suddenly stand up behind the United States and sanction Russia at the price of their own energy, at the price of everything else, China's gonna say, wait a second, if we do something and they can invoke that kind of diplomatic pressure, we gotta think twice. So that's why I think at this juncture, that's the right position. It is a position that's been debated constantly. It's a principal position on both sides and there are arguments on both sides, but that's where I feel that we can really, or we really should stay. Yes, sir, I've got lots of questions uh, in there. <laughs> Senator Reid, thank you for taking my sure. question. I, I wanna ask you why, okay, uh, are we allowing the Chinese uh, to misunderstand strategic ambiguity by uh, uh, taking some of those islands and building military bases on it and creating all sorts of threatening actions to Taiwan, okay? And we basically sit back and worry about strategic ambiguity. And my question to you is, uh, don't we have an opportunity to change our policies because China is changing their policies? They are the ones that are becoming more threatening to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that are establishing military islands, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what my question is, basically, yeah. okay? No, I think, frankly, the, their development of the military islands, we obviously didn't handle well at all. Part of that, I think, was we were still, in some degree, politically diverted by Afghanistan and Iraq. That that was a problem, but that's not the big problem, and you can't, Forget that aspect. There was a situation under the Obama administration where they were threatening to take islands that were, and I can't recall the exact name, and I couldn't pronounce it if I did, uh, which were Japanese claimed, and claimed also by the, uh, uh, the Chinese. They claim everything. And we were able to get them to step down on that. They didn't push forward on that. And that was because of direct communication between president to president. And that's why I talk frequently about we have got to get communications. Uh, we've got to be able to talk to people, particularly in a crisis. Uh, so I think that um, I, I would hesitate to say that they, they've satiated their appetite for new islands and all that stuff, no. But I think the last instance we had, we were able to convince them that this is a serious thing. We would take it seriously. And it would not be an issue of strategic ambiguity, it'd be an issue of violation of international law with our close ally, Japan, and we're serious. So that's one response to the question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. I'm Nick Vozdev. I teach in the National Security Affairs Department here. First, I want to assure you I was involved in curriculum review this morning for our forthcoming intermediate course, and most of the themes you raised in your address will be covered in the curriculum. So the faculty will be delivering on that. Um, Thank I you. wanted to touch uh, on a point you made about reaching out to our allies and partners. We have to show that we're a, a better option. Uh, and there's a lot of things, health security, energy security, ally shoring, resilient supply chain. But this isn't something that just can be done by the armed services and foreign relations committees. There's a domestic angle to that. Are you finding among your colleagues that there's a recognition that uh, competing with China effectively and preventing it from being confrontational is, is going to also require you know, movement and the CHIPS Act is one example. Do you think that's a foundation we're going to see a bipartisan consensus developing that we can move forward on? Well, I, I certainly hope so. Uh, and the CHIPS Act is a good example. That was a bipartisan effort. I think my colleague Todd Young who I, the rumor is he graduated from the Naval Academy, but I, that's just a rumor. Uh, he did a he did a superb job. He was what you would expect from a senator. He played, you know, getting everyone together, along with uh, Lita Schumer. They were the two keys. That's something we have to do, and we have to do more of. Uh, but again, I think we're caught up in a situation where we're undervaluing our soft power, our diplomats, our uh, 
people who invest in and help people with uh, projects of development, et cetera. Uh, and it's funny because, you know, in the Cold War, that was a big part of our competition with the Soviets. And I can recall up in Afghanistan visiting the dam we built, and there was a rock, and there's this faded paint, uh, painting of the hands clasping each other, the old signal of, I forget the title of the program, but it was everywhere in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now, we haven't done a lot of that. Uh, and we have to do more. But then what happens is we get caught up in fights like on nominations, which or scheduling nominations, things that ultimately affect the outcome, but it's not considered in those terms. It's much more personal and parochial, and it's a, it's a, a, a cost of our system. We have benefits, but a cost of our system. But I think people are beginning to understand, I hope, that this is a multidimensional multi-dimensional approach. Uh, certainly in, in the issue of cyber, we get that. Uh, but we just have to get the other things too. Um, and we'll see. Um, but uh, I'm glad you have the curriculum here. One of the more interesting moments I had here was going to the graduation about when I was a congressman of the intermediate class. And my classmate, John Moore, United States Army, was first in the class. I was very proud. <laughs> I will. Well, one of the great treats I used to have is every year the international students would come down and I'd meet with them and we'd have a great discussion. But I understand, we all understand, I think, in this room is that, you know, 20 years from now, they're going to be chief of service. And I can remember, too, when I was visiting Pakistan and Kayani, who was a difficult guy to deal with and several other difficult people to deal with, but he had been a graduate of Fort Leavenworth. And some of his classmates actually were able to go out there and sit down with him and say, hey, you used to, I, I'm, you used to hang around with us. And so it, well, at least we had a bridge. I had, um, but my class at West Point, uh, one of my classmates was uh, chief of the Philippine Armed Forces, uh, General Narcisco Abaya. And the other one was chief of the forces in Thailand. Uh, <laughs> We used to call him Bob at West Point, but that was not his name. <laughs> but no, and this is that soft power. And by the way, as I mentioned in my comment, we're giving uh, the operational commanders, uh, Admiral Aquilino and others, the ability now to go out and say, hey, we want to set up an exchange with uh, these you know, young 04s, 05s, bring them in, we'll send people in like that, where before that was, you know, couldn't do that. That was State Department. So we're giving them that authority. Anyone there's else? Been, there's been a lot of, you've talked a lot about uh, cybersecurity and um, okay. there's been a lot of talk about conventional improvement. You're gonna have to shout, man, because oh, you're, sorry. I'm a paratrooper and I have, can't hear a I thing. I don't know where to hold this. Yeah. Oh, closer to me? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, there, you've talked a lot about cybersecurity and um, conventional, improving conventional readiness and weapons and all of that. It seems to me that I've just never understood why don't we focus on taking out the enemy's satellites uh, that would, you know, rather than fighting the conventional wars. Well, here's the, the brief history from my perspective, and it's certainly not conclusive. 20 years ago, space was benign, and, you know, we didn't prepare weapon systems, et cetera. And we had to sort of, uh, the understanding that we would not put weapons in space. Of course, China and Russia have weapons in space today. We are, uh, and we are recognize that, and we have to obviously take steps to protect our satellites, we are. But one of the first areas of conflict will be cyber and space, because they're linked so dramatically. And we have to have the ability to protect our satellites and also to, uh, well, let me just stop and protect our satellites. But the other thing we're doing is we understand that, you know, they're vulnerable. And so the new model is not one big huge like it was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, one big satellite that could do everything. It's a lot of small satellites that can be lost, but they're replaced quickly by another one that's still in orbit. So space is now an era of, of conflict. We, and to 
you know, the Trump administration created the Space Corps, which makes sense. It also makes sense, I think, from my view, that it's part of the Air Force still. And that Space Corps is focused exactly on what you brought up. How do we protect our satellites? How do we defeat other satellites if they're threats to us? That maintains communication, maintains all sorts of things we need. Uh, and then, you know, frankly, when we talk about operational training, uh, you know, we have to assume worst case. So we're, we're going to have to train in the Pacific as if we didn't have GPS, as if we didn't have, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, communications. Uh, I once had, uh, I, I had the, uh, uh, I think I had the, the, the commandant in my office, one of the commandants, we were talking about that, and I asked him, I said, I'm curious, do you still have landlines? You know, older people in the audience know what a landline is. It's a crank phone. And, <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, geez, I don't know, sir. And I said, well, you know, you got to assume someday you might not have combo. And I, I'd re rather than sending up a runner, <laughs> I'd rather pick up the phone and say, hey, what's going on up there? But, you know, one of the best lines I had, because we're talking about technology, is what does path-breaking technology do? And it was a pr president of the university said, it does two things. It makes good things better and bad things worse. So our challenge today is to take the good things and get them out there and protect against the bad things. And in some respects, space represents that example. GPS, instantaneous communication, all the things it provides. But it, it, is, it could be a, a weak link and a vulnerability if we over rely upon it and we don't have backups. So we're thinking about that too in, in the military force. Anybody else? I'm Senator, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Back here. Hello. Um, for me personally, the inadequacy and wishful thinking that's been embodied in American strategic thought about the geopolitical challenges that we face abroad was crystallized recently because both apparently Russia and China have now deployed hypersonic missile capability that we don't have and don't have an answer to. Am I wrong? Uh, we are working very diligent that it's been reported in the press, for example, the Army has fired successfully a hypersonic uh, weapon from a ground-based uh, artillery component. Uh, so we are working on hypersonics. One of the things that was, is, I found very ironic is that um, we were do developing in the 80s hypersonic technologies and we stopped. I don't know why we stopped, but, you know, one reason I think was we, we considered at that point when we had only one nuclear competitor, Russia, and we were in a series of arms control agreements that appeared to have sort of put a boundary around what we do, that hypersonics would be disruptive and could alter. Now, again, you can describe this to inattention or, or, or focus on other areas. The last 20 years, the Russians have picked up that research They've developed it. The Chinese, of course, have demonstrated a hypersonic uh, weapon system that they can fly around the, you know, in orbit, and then it breaks off and comes down and hits the target, uh, you know, within feet. We are trying to. That's where we're trying to catch up, and we understand that. Uh, the rationale, I think, there's a little bit of uh, uh, trying to avoid with the Russians uh, st strategic. Uh, disruption and you know throw off our at that point 90s certainly a well relatively well controlled nuclear partnership between both countries and the other factor was there was just so many other issues in front of it you know one of the great examples to me is you know uh, when Bob Gates came in who was a terrific Secretary of Defense both under President Bush and under President Obama you know he said, listen, I got to protect my troops. And so we started building those uh, large uh, vehicles that were uh, MRAPs. Yeah, we built MRAPs because the troops needed it. And, and he was, uh, was going to get the troops they needed. But while we were building MRAPs, the Russians were investing in hypersonics, the Chinese were investing in all sorts of stuff. So when we deploy, redeploy from Afghanistan, 
We got some MRAPs out, but we don't need them. They're not that effective in a, you know, um, air land battle. And we frankly ended up cutting most of them up for scrap in Afghanistan. So all these other forces were in place. But the reality is we're behind them on hypersonics, but we're not sitting back and saying, well, we lost. Uh, armies deployed them. Air Force is working hard on some system, air systems. Uh, again, this issue of time, if we have sufficient time, I, I think we'll end up with better systems. You know, I guess one analogy might be, you know, when they launched Sputnik, we said, holy cow. But you know, several years later, we were in gear focused and we were getting ready to put a man on the moon. So I think well, hopefully that'll be the outcome or the trajectory. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reid, uh, for your exceptional remarks and, and commentary. Uh, you've certainly given us, given us a lot to think about today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, have a one more round of applause for Senator Reid. I know, I know we just had lunch, but we're going to take a quick break. Um, so there are refreshments uh, just in the back. Uh, there are restrooms uh, the next deck up behind. But we're going to go ahead and get started sharply at 2 o'clock. So please uh, be seated by then. Thank you. <laughs>